Okay, great. Yeah, so let's get started. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, excited to be here to talk to you all today. Uh, so the topic for today is smart devices and smart clothing, the future of health monitoring. So I'm the chief operating officer here at Somatics, been with the company for almost two years uh, and been in the health tech space, really excited at the intersection of healthcare and technology. So my, I also have a background uh, in high tech, uh, been a startup advisor for a few years, acted as an adjunct faculty for uh, courses in product management. Uh, so with that, let's get started. So uh, the flow of the presentation is that I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation. What are the factors that are leading towards this uh, smart devices, smart homes, smart clothing? Then talk a little bit about connected health, how everything is sort of coming together. Then talk a little bit about uh, Somatics' safe being platform, because uh, we have built uh, truly a great AI-powered remote patient monitoring platform. Would uh, love to give you a little bit of an overview around what that platform is about. Then talk a little bit about uh, smart homes, how the paradigm of connected health comes into play, and especially with all of the uh, the changes that are happening from a technological perspective, how that's uh, a, truly not a um, something that's uh, 10 to 15 years away, but it's there right now. And then finally, I'll summarize uh, with some conclusions and what are the things that I'm excited about uh, going in the next few years. Okay, so over the past decade or so, wearable technology, especially wristbands, watches, rings, have, have gained immense popularity. Uh, and also it has, uh, st and I'm starting to see the movement from variables that are used purely from an athletic perspective, athletic purpose, to how is it that it can be used to improve a patient's health. And that's, that's something that really excites me. And here are some stats. Uh, one in four Americans own a smartwatch or a fitness tracker. So you can see that the adoption of uh, these wearables, especially the smartwatches, wristbands, is increasing drastically, especially with uh, the Fitbits of the world, the Apple Watches of the world, uh, the Whoops of the world, right? Um, so truly, wearables have entered the mainstream. And some of the factors that, that have really enabled that is uh, the improvement in the internet speeds, the technology around it, uh, the adoption of cloud, uh, you know, like pushing your data into the cloud, the security aspects in the cloud. I, th I think these, these have really gone a long way in that mainstream adoption. Uh, smartphones, you know, like the form factors, the cameras, the, the amount of uh, sensors that are being packed onto the smartphones have drastically increased. Uh, uh, 5G, you know, like uh, just just the the cellular speeds, the Wi-Fi speeds have drastically increased. So the processing of the data that gets collected through these uh, wearables, uh, e either using the Wi-Fi technology or uh, BLE technology, and doing doing the number crunching, whether it's uh, uh, on the device itself or after the data is being pushed onto the cloud uh, and done in real time has really increased. And that's the value that it is providing to the users of these wristbands of these uh, smartwatches. The battery life on them has drastically increased as well. So that, that really uh, improves the use of these devices and, and the use cases that they are being used for, whether it's uh, uh, in, in a healthcare setting, in a hospital setting, that has really enabled. And then also uh, the adoption of uh, business models around SaaS, whether it's uh, um, B2C or B2B, I think the adoption of these business models have uh, really opened up uh, from a business perspective around revenue streams uh, for these wearable devices. And so there's, there's also this talk about uh, this uh, quantified self movement, right? Uh, uh, so we are collecting a whole lot of data continuously, passively using the sensors 
that are on built onto these, uh, whether it's the cellular phones or or the uh, smart bands, right? Uh, and sort of the collection of the data means, okay, now I am seeing a whole lot of data around uh, what's happening with me, whether it's uh, related to activities of daily living, uh, and then sort of what do I do with that data, right? Uh, then comes the aspect of uh, AI ML, adaptive machine learning, where it really learns the user and uh, compares that data against, okay, what are the uh, thresholds for a person with uh, uh, good health or someone with a deteriorating health? So based upon the data that gets collected, you can identify trends and patterns. And then that finally leads to uh, better outcomes, right? So now that you have the data, you have analyzed it, identified the trends and patterns, what is it that you do next? And that's something that I'm really excited about to see where do we take this that is moving from an athletic option to a, a, a clinical imperative, right? Um, so uh, some of you may be aware of uh, this, uh, you know, aspects around connected health, right? So here, here is a pictorial representation as to how is it that we can use the patches, the socks, shoes, wearable devices, the rings, the, the smart shirts, and the vest. Uh, you know, so just, just to give you a couple of examples here, is that with the shoe itself, you know, like you have the odometer embedded on it, so you can uh, uh, get a better sense of your steps. Uh, how is the uh, balance of your feet? Whether are you uh, putting your uh, uh, feet, uh, you know, appropriately or not? Or are you uh, prone to injury? So all of these can, you know, the data that gets collected can really improve with your balance, right? Uh, so that you can avoid uh, being injured. So this this can be, very useful for athletes as well as uh, uh, for, um, you know, like people like you and me as well, right? Uh, then smart shirts, right? So it detects your posture, your heart rate, your respiration patterns. So let's say if your posture is poor, then through the data that gets collected, uh, uh, these, these, uh, uh, smart clothings, especially the vest and the smart shirt, uh, have, uh, uh, you know, like can provide audio feedback as well as uh, haptic vibrations through which you can improve your posture. So you collect the data, process it real time, and then based on the feedback that you get, you can correct your posture. So, and then if you're doing that over a period of time, so you can see a drastic improvement in your posture, right? So, uh, so this is how I think uh, uh, all of the things can truly come together and lead towards a person having a better life, and that's that's something I'm truly excited about. So, here's here's another example around uh, wearable health electronics. Uh, so, this this uh, is an article um, I read. Uh, a while ago, uh, like published at The Economist. Uh, and I really like the aspect around detect a disease before it develops, right? Uh, through these wearable devices, whether it's uh, uh, the earphones, the headphones, the, uh, the sweatbands, whether it's um, the glucose monitor, whether it's the chest strap, uh, smart clothing that we talked about in the previous slide, the aura ring, uh, the wristband, where there are these bunch of sensors that are packed into these uh, small form factors, whether you talk about the rings or the wristbands, right? Uh, uh, sensors such as accelerometer, gyroscope, barometer, skin temperature, then PPG sensors uh, that include heart rate, uh, blood oxygen saturation. So, so just imagine that uh, through these sensors, you are collecting a plethora of data around different types of health indicators. And then all of these come together to establish a pattern around what is happening with you or whoever is wearing uh, these, uh, these wearables, right? 
Then now the next step is, okay, great. You're collecting a whole lot of data continuously, passively through these variables. So now this is where um, the, the interactions between the users and the doctors uh, come into play, where uh, I'm seeing uh, a lot of adoption, a lot of uh, you know, like positivity from uh, uh, the healthcare providers, physicians, and nurses as well in, in uh, being open to looking at the data that's being collected through these variables so that you can identify the deviations in uh, um, certain metrics, certain health metrics for, for a patient so that they can identify uh, the, the development of a disease before, before it truly happens. You can see those early signs, right? Uh, uh, so the, I'm, I'm seeing that shift in uh, the healthcare providers having that open-mindedness to look at the variables. And what has enabled that is uh, the accuracy of the data, uh, because we're using AIML predictive analytics uh, to provide certain clinical insights. Uh, and for in order for the healthcare providers uh, uh, to, to truly adopt that, you want to make sure that... Uh, the sensitivity and, spe and specificity of your algorithms, the accuracy of the data is high enough so that uh, there is that high level of confidence with the, the healthcare providers. Right? And this can truly result in uh, big changes in the prevention of chronic diseases, you know, such as uh, heart diseases, diabetes. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, as I said, it's great to see the transition from uh, variables uh, being mainly used by athletes uh, to uh, uh, the majority of the population. Okay, so let me uh, transition and zoom a little bit uh, into what we do at Somatics. Uh, so we are a health tech startup. We believe in the power of innovating AI technologies to provide insights that empower people to thrive in their health and wellness. So our tagline is uh, insights that empower. So we track users' activities of daily living using uh, novel gesture-based detection. So, uh, so imagine I'm wearing a wristband and through my gestures, I'm making a gesture of, uh, let's say, uh, drinking water. So that entire sequence of me picking up a cup, rotating it, like putting the water in my mouth and, uh, you know, like putting the cup down. So this entire sequence of uh, steps is the identification that, okay, somebody uh, uh, did um, drink some liquid, right? Uh, so we can also detect uh, smoking and a bunch of other things I'll talk about in the next few slides. But through the variables itself, uh, we, we detect a whole lot of patterns. And then based on that, um, the, the collection of the data, we provide alerts, reminders, notifications to uh, the users directly or to the healthcare providers of, of those patients if they are in a, a nursing home or in a hospital setting. So the platform consists of uh, four components. The first one is uh, the caregiver dashboard. So just, just to take a quick step back. So we are in a, a, a B2B SaaS environment uh, where our customers are healthcare providers. So the nurses, the physicians across the care continuum, starting from independent living to assisted living to semi-assisted living and also outpatients in hospitals. And we have also seen quite a bit of traction with the rehab centers as well. Okay, so I talked about uh, the dashboard. So this is where you enter the user information and you can see a whole lot of uh, charts and graphs based on uh, the analytics that we provide around the data that we collect, uh, the AIML algorithms that we apply on top of the data. And then based on that, we provide predictive analytics. Is a person at a risk of UTI, pressure sore risk, hospital readmission, fall risk? And then we also have uh, a bunch of apps, user apps, where the user can go onto the app and look at their data as to how is it that they are doing, the number of steps, uh, 
how much did they sleep not only the quantity of sleep but also the quality of sleep as well was you know like there are these uh, phases of sleep so uh, um, so how is it that uh, the user slept right and then there's a caretaker app usually the nurses uh, the caregivers are always on the go and they are managing a number of patients maybe uh, 10 to 15 patients uh, in a particular shift so if they have the caretaker app and they get the alerts and reminders, notifications for a certain subset of patients so that they can prioritize that and go and look after that patient. So that this not only uh, increases their effectiveness of providing care to their patients, but also um, uh, we have seen based on our studies that it also increases the empathy that they have for their patients. And then everything, everything is predicated on the smart band. So we have built our own smart band. Um, we can also use our platform on top of some of the commercially available smart bands. We decided to build our own smart band because uh, the feedback that we received uh, from our users was that the battery needs to last uh, three to six days. Uh, it needs to be cost effective. So that was one of the reasons why we decided to build our own smart band it uses commercially available sensors but um, we wanted to make sure that it has that high battery life because uh, most of the commercially available smart bands we see that the battery life is around one day one and a half day maybe max two days okay so here are a few things that we monitor um, to to our knowledge um, we feel like our smart bands do a whole lot than some of the commercially available smart bands. So we can not only detect uh, simple things that other smart bands do, like uh, uh, walking, sleeping, but uh, we can also detect forward falling. You know, Apple Watch does uh, forward falling, but we can not only detect forward falls, but also backward falls, sideways falls, falls from a wheelchair. One of our biggest competitive advantage is uh, drinking. We can not only detect that somebody uh, um, is drinking, but we can also quantify as to how much liquid intake did the person have. Uh, and this is all based upon our, our patented gesture-based detection technology, that is the, the detection of the motion of drinking and the conversion of sips to milliliters of liquid intake. One of the other feature that we are working towards is medication intake. Um, this, is, this is something that we are very excited about. In fact, we are partnering with uh, Roche Pharmaceuticals, uh, where they have a program called Innovation in Dementia. And uh, they, they want this uh, capability where, especially for, you know, like people with dementia, it's hard for them to self-report whether they have taken some medication or not. So let's take the example that a uh, user needed to take some medication at 12 p.m. Uh, but they forgot to take it. So our band, what it would do is that it would detect, oh, you know what? Uh, this person was supposed to take some medication at 12 p.m., but I didn't detect that gesture of somebody putting a pill in their hand, putting it in their mouth, having uh, uh, liquid or no liquid after that. But uh, we didn't detect that sequence of uh, somebody taking uh, some medication. So then... And we have done that uh, passively without any intervention, either from the, the nurse, caretaker, or the patient himself or herself. So now once we detect that somebody didn't take uh, their medication, we can send them reminders every 15 minutes so that they can go ahead and take their pills. Now smoking. In fact, we started the company Somatics uh, with uh, our smoking cessation product. Uh, so where we can not only detect uh, the, uh, the motion of smoking, but we can also calibrate it uh, down to the accuracy level of how many puffs of cigarette did, did somebody inhale. Then we also calibrate all of the activities of uh, daily living in our next generation smart band, which just uh, we released about a month ago. It also has an optical PPG sensor. So now we can get uh, additional vitals such as heart rate, SpO2, skin temperature. And then we 
collect all of this uh, data continuously and passively and then apply machine learning, adaptive machine learning for that particular user and provide clinical insights such as UTI risk. Now you may wonder, okay, so how is it that we do UTI risk analysis purely through a variable? So the data points that we correlate uh, to identify whether a person is at a risk of UTI is uh, their hydration levels, you know, like with the drinking detection part. Uh, uh, then how many times is this person waking up at night and probably going to the bathroom? So uh, the amount of time that they are waking up, uh, uh, their activity levels, are they... Um, uh, more inactive during the day versus night? Uh, what, what is their sleeping patterns? How many times are they waking up? So correlating all of these, after correlating all of these factors, we, we sort of uh, uh, build the risk profile for, for a particular user and then identify whether is this person is at a risk of UTI. So similarly, we do uh, pressure sore risk analysis. Uh, so let's say if a patient... Uh, uh, um, sleeps for a certain stretch of time and, and doesn't uh, move around after two to three hours, then that particular patient uh, is, is at a risk of having, uh, you know, like pressure sore. So now once we identify this risk, we send out notifications through the dashboard, through the caretaker apps to the nurses and the caretakers so that they can go and prioritize who they look after and go and take care of those patients. So with our technology, uh, everything is uh, passive. We are continuously collecting the data. Uh, there is no need to install any camera, sensors, beamers in the rooms where the user or the patient is. So, um, and, and uh, everything is done, as I said, passively. So there is no intervention needed either from the patient or by their caregivers. It works both indoors as well as outdoors. And here's uh, one of the three broad categories of things that we monitor. Real-time emergencies, a person has fallen, you know, like the fall detection part, wandering part, they left their the only thing that uh, uh, active thing, I guess, that our smart pant has is one button. So if a user uh, needs some help or um, there's some emergency, then they can press that button. Also, the emergency can be triggered uh, automatically. They don't need to press anything, but if they need help, they can press the button and then uh, it triggers a signal either to uh, the family member or to the caregiver so that they can come and help the patient. Clinical insights, uh, you know, I talked about the hydration, the nighttime walking, the irregularities in the patterns, and then the predictive analytics part. I talked about the UTI risk, fall risk, and pressure sore risk. Okay, so here um, are some um, charts and graphs. I won't go into the details, but uh, here you can see on the top uh, left, uh, it's a breakdown of your sleep. Uh, what's your... Um, daytime sleep uh, versus nighttime sleep. How many times have you woken up uh, throughout the night? Uh, uh, and also what's your sleep quality score? So we use a peer reviewed scale, Pittsburgh scale index, which goes from zero to hundred. And then um, we, we rate uh, each sleep session. So you can see uh, over a period of uh, days or weeks, you can identify a pattern. And if there's, a deteriorating pattern for the quality of sleep, then that's where um, uh, the nurse and the caregiver can have an intervention and see what's happening with this patient. So at the uh, bottom left, you see a heat map, which uh, shows the activity levels at what hours of the day, either a person has fallen or, um, or has liquid intake. Uh, here you can't see the blue cups, but that's what it's uh, uh, indicating. Then on the extreme right, you'll see uh, the configuration tab, which shows what are the settings uh, that could be turned on or off based upon what are the events, notifications, reminders uh, that uh, um, can be set for a particular patient so that uh, 
the nurse and the caretaker can triage that. So as you can see here, our platform is very dynamic in terms of uh, the amount of data that it provides uh, uh, to the user, family member and caregivers, but also uh, uh, sort of uh, the robustness in the platform to uh, uh, cater towards different use cases. And here's, here's a slide that basically uh, shows the, the workflow. I know it's a, it's a very busy uh, um, graphic here, but here all I want to uh, showcase here is that uh, everything starts uh, uh, with the smart band. Then with the smart band detects the gestures, then it sends uh, that data uh, that is detected through these uh, sensors, either through Bluetooth, then onto the phone, and then from the phone, it pushes to the cloud or through Wi-Fi directly from the band uh, onto the cloud. And in the cloud is where uh, um, deep number crunching happens, mapping with our AIML algorithms happens. And then based on the identification of the uh, patterns, the risk analysis, uh, uh, then also uh, the clinical insights, all of that then gets pushed on to the dashboards and onto the, the various apps that we have on our platform, okay? Okay, so now uh, let's, let's uh, switch gears and uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the other smart wearables that are out in the market. So smart socks, you know, uh, now this, this is becoming uh, a part of everyday life for, for some of the people. Uh, uh, so even here, the form factor of the sensors has drastically increased that now it can be embedded into uh, the sock, right? And then with through that, you're collecting a whole lot of data, once again, continuously and passively. So now what this helps us uh, do, as uh, stated in the slide, is that you can do uh, step counting, um, uh, the speed with which you are walking or running, your calorie intake, your altitude, because there are also there's also a barometer sensor in there which uh, accurately calibrates your your altitude, then distance tracking, uh, cadence. How is it that your feet is is uh, um, landing on the floor, on the ground, and then based on that, it can provide haptic feedback either. Uh, through vibrations and enable people to improve uh, uh, their their cadence so that, and, and then if you keep doing that over a period of time, uh, it's going to, you know, uh, avoid somebody having injuries just because of how they are landing their feet, right? So you can, like, I can see use cases, not only just for athletes to improve that and avoid injuries, but also for, uh, normal people, for common people who are not athletes, right? Uh, so this is this is great. Uh, um, then there are these uh, uh, smart yoga pants, uh, which can which can which can provide a private yoga experience to somebody uh, who is uh, not very experienced in yoga and wants to get into yoga to further improve their health. Uh, they can use uh, something like these uh, uh, smart yoga pants. Once again, you know, uh, there are these uh, accelerometer, gyroscopes, various sensors that are embedded into uh, these, these yoga pants, which collect a whole lot of data and can provide real-time feedback so that as you're um, going through the yoga session, you can improve your posture and uh, thereby get... Uh, um, uh, the true feel of uh, doing a yoga session. And this is also where then you don't need to have uh, an instructor watching after every single step, but it's uh, just through the smart yoga pants, you can uh, uh, teach yourself yoga. So which, which, which I find just, just fascinating. Then I just recently heard about uh, Gatorade coming up uh, with this GX smart water bottle. So the components of uh, these water bottle uh, is of course the bottle, then the smart cap, 
which uh, has a bunch of sensors as well as uh, some LEDs that light up. And then uh, a sweat patch uh, that, that goes around um, with uh, uh, this particular water bottle. So what you could do, uh, I guess mainly it's catered towards the athletes right now, but uh, I don't see why it cannot be used by other people as well. So uh, there's, there's this app, you wear this sweat patch, and when uh, based on the data that it's uh, sending, it identifies uh, uh, levels where the hydration is lower, and then it triggers that signal onto the water bottle so that the water bottle lights up and uh, um, indicates that uh, you, as the user, should should take uh, uh, you know uh, you know sort of hydrate yourself, take take more liquid. So I can easily see a collaboration between GatorX and uh, uh, the way we uh, you know Somatics is safe being platform uh, does the drinking detection and quantification of the drinking. So I could I could easily see uh, some sort of uh, a collaboration project going forward. So uh, the bottom line here is uh, personalized nutrition and training platform using this uh, 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 platform around smart water bottle. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, switch gears a bit and let's talk about uh, uh, smart homes. Uh, uh, so here we, we are in talks uh, with... Uh, um, a smart TV manufacturer where they are trying to see how is it that uh, the smart TV can act as a connected hub and along with wearable devices such as ours, uh, Somatics' uh, um, safe being smart band, uh, how is it that you can improve the quality of life of uh, senior citizens? So here the components of this uh, connected health platform would be the smart TV that acts as a hub, Bluetooth enabled medical devices, along with our uh, smart band. So here's, here's sort of a, a mocked up screenshot of uh, what type of data uh, the user, in our case, uh, elderly citizen would uh, uh, look at on their TV screen. Oh, so what's their activity levels? their vitals, uh, um, what are the appointments that they have, certain reminders about medication intake, what are their uh, uh, health trends looking like, are there any uh, televisits that they need to do, uh, just, just using the remote control, also they can, they can press the health button, um, like what are the exercises that they could do uh, using the TV. So, so how is it that you can bring the smart TV, which acts as a hub, pushes the data onto the cloud, uh, along with some of the other devices, such as the smart bands and other third-party medical devices, Bluetooth-enabled devices. So here's, here's sort of how that workflow would look like. You know, you have the smart band, you connect uh, it to the cloud, either through Wi-Fi or through BLE, and then you connect it to the smart TV hub. You also have uh, other appliances in the room, whether it's uh, the refrigerators, uh, the air conditioning, the lights, uh, the washing machine. How is it that it can all come together to uh, not only collect data, but also uh, once you have identified the trends and patterns in terms of uh, when a person is waking up at night, how often, so if the person is waking up, is not having a restful sleep, is there a way that we can trigger a signal to, let's say, uh, the smart speakers, whether the Alexas of the world, and play some soothing music, right? This is all based upon the fact that once we identified that a person is not having a restful sleep, right? Uh, so there are these multiple use cases that we come up with. I just want to make you know, uh, the audience aware a little bit as to what are the possibilities here of um, uh, bringing all of these smart devices together under a single umbrella with this smart hub and thereby improve the quality of life of a person. 
So um, once again, sort of uh, double downing a little bit on uh, the previous two slides, uh, uh, some of the things that, that we are thinking about, um, you know, here on the left-hand side is what is it that uh, uh, Somatics' uh, safe being platform can do? We talked about the, the walking, sleeping, hydration, heart rate, all of the um, data that we collect continuously, passively, 24-7. Uh, also, we can integrate with uh, third-party devices uh, such as blood pressure cuffs, scale, uh, uh, blood oxygen saturation meters, and then push all of that data into a single platform so that you can have a holistic view of a person's health. Then that combined with uh, the devices that are uh, sitting in a home, right? Uh, the, the speakers, refrigerator, the, the washing machine, the vacuum, air conditioning, uh, the lighting, right? Uh, so here, uh, then here on the right-hand side, uh, how is it that you could um, collect all of the data and put it all together to give a, and build a picture around the holistic health and wellness context of a person? So some of the use cases that we identified are around UTI. I talked about that for quite a bit uh, uh, in the previous few slides. Uh, the frequency of the trips to the bathroom, which, which increases, you know, if there are frequent trips at night, it's dark. Uh, so there's that potential of uh, uh, a person falling. In fact, some numbers show that in the US alone, uh, there are, there are uh, 800,000 falls every year, which, which is a pretty big number. Uh, so how is it that you could avoid? Okay, so if you identify that somebody is, a, is at a risk of falling, they're waking up frequently at night, so you could, uh, based upon uh, the location of the bathroom versus their bedroom, the, uh, the path towards that, you could turn on the lights so uh, you can avoid those falls, right? Uh, the dehydration piece we talked about uh, 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 in the previous slide, falls, then sleep analytics, you can get these uh, uh, deep analytics, not only just around the quantity of sleep, but also the quality of sleep. And how is it that you can bring all of that together to, um, to build that picture around the health and wellness context of a person and thereby further improve uh, their quality of life, right? Uh, so here, here are some other examples, uh, you know, waking up at night, we talked about it. Um, then the IoT devices communicate with each other. Uh, let's say if someone is sleeping, uh, you know, at that time you don't want to turn the washing machine or, or the vacuum. So all of that uh, could uh, be set automatically through the settings based upon the data that gets collected. Okay, so finally, I would like to summarize by saying that uh, remote patient monitoring is a powerful tool to provide not only unique insights and alerts, but also to reduce the clinical risk factors. Um, I think if anything, COVID has really accelerated the adoption of uh, technology in the healthcare space, which traditionally has been uh, slow in adopting new technology. I am truly excited about the future. You know, uh, uh, technology has um, a great, great potential to unlock and, uh, you know, uh, improve the quality of life of people. And I'm seeing this shift from moving from clinical insights to health outcomes. And, you know, like all of these, you um, things, whether it's around um, smart homes, uh, connected health, uh, wearables, whether it's the wristbands, uh, patches, earphones, everything, all of that shift, all of that uh, usage of data, uh, hopefully at some point in the future, in the recent future, will, will reduce healthcare costs, uh, will we'll move from um, an inpatient setting to a outpatient setting uh, and also we'll, we'll sort of uh, uh, see that shift from disease care to, to health care, right? Uh, uh, and sort of uh, shift from being reactive to being proactive 
and uh, then to being predictive. Right? With, with, with the uber goal of improving the quality of life. And, and this, this is something uh, that I'm excited about. This is something that uh, uh, Somatics uh, as a company is excited about as well. So with that, I would uh, like to pause, stop here, and uh, uh, I'm open for any questions. If you if you want to connect with me, uh, uh, here here is my information. You can email me, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, website for more information as well. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Amit. That was awesome. That was really interesting. Uh, extremely fascinating what's happening in, in the wearable space right now. Um, so while we wait to see if there's any questions that come in, um, let me ask you this. What, what are your predictions for 2023 in, in this space? Yeah, uh, you know, as, as, as I uh, stated in my previous slide, I'm really excited about uh, seeing that shift from uh, these wearables um, being an athletic option to, to truly coming into uh, – the health tech into the healthcare aspect, whereby there is this uh, massive adoption of uh, looking at the data. I think we are really moving in the right direction in terms of improving uh, the accuracy, the sensitivity and specificity of the algorithm so that there is this high level of confidence with the healthcare providers to truly adopt uh, these these technologies, right? Then, then the other yep. thing I'm excited about is, uh, um, you know, AI ML has been there for quite some time, uh, but we also need and want to make sure that uh, there is, you know, ethical AI. So there, uh, you know, like we need to solve uh, these uh, uh, questions or concerns around, uh, uh, you know, like the provider versus payer versus patient, how does ethical AI sort of uh, uh, come into play into, into these aspects? Uh, there are certain overlaps between these things. So how do we resolve those things and make sure that uh, we truly um, build the health equity, right? Uh, yeah. Then personalized medicine. This, this is something I'm really excited about is that in the past, it has been about with, you know, having this 80-20 rule where we are... Uh, um, you know, like building solutions, whether it's technology, whether it's drugs to cover 80% of the population, not necessarily the 20%, but uh, how is it that, uh, you know, like technology, especially AI ML, where we are collecting this uh, vast amount of data continuously, passively, 24-7, that can open the gateways towards covering that 20% and making sure that we are building personalized medicine, personalized solutions for everybody and uh, making sure that everybody has uh, equal access to healthcare and health solutions. Amazing. Yeah, I definitely, I'm going to connect with you offline because I have uh, several other questions, but I want to uh, take up space. We do have a question that just came in. So um, Akasha Ask, what is your growth strategy outside in the U.S.? Is it based on partnerships? And if so, what is your ideal partner profile? Yeah. Um, so currently we are expanding in Europe. In fact, you know, like earlier I talked about uh, this, this project with Roche that we are doing where they have this program around innovation in dementia. Uh, so this, this, this program is being launched uh, in, in Portugal where uh, the government there is um, wanting to improve the quality of life, especially with people with dementia. And this is where uh, we are truly excited to partner with Roche and working with a couple of hospitals uh, in, in Lisbon. Um, uh, you know, I talked about this medication compliance aspect. That's something that we are building and that's going to be... Uh, uh, an international launch for us in Portugal. So super excited about that. But yeah, uh, uh, going going to Akshay's question, um, sort of our strategy towards uh, uh, growth is going to be partnerships in the sense that uh, um, you want to build um, a holistic solution 
for people. So yeah, we may, you know, like from a variables perspective, uh, like we are double downing on that in the sense that we are adding more and more sensors onto the variables. So sort of uh, uh, the, the phrase being used these days is clinic on the wrist. So you're packing as much sensors as possible onto your variable so that you can collect a whole lot of data and thereby provide clinical insights, do risk analysis and so on, right? But then, uh, you know, I talked about this paradigm around connected health with smart homes where you're collecting data from uh, other devices uh, as well. Uh, and how is it that you can work smoothly with all of that data so that, you know, integrate integration of that data um, is, is going to be very critical. I think uh, whoever does that job really well going forward would uh, do, do really well, both, both from uh, improving the quality of life people perspective, as well as from a business perspective as well. So I think uh, um, API integrations of collecting that data, porting it, putting it in a single uh, uh, pane of glass so that you can do your analytics on top of that. I think uh, that's that's going to be the key. So partnerships, yes, I completely agree with Akshay. That's that's going to be the key going forward. Amazing. And they just added a, a, a second part to the question. So we didn't hear you talk much about CGM devices. Are these part of your roadmap? And is the trend moving towards using these beyond diabetes patients for preventive lifestyle improvement? Yeah, uh, you know, like we we do uh, third party integrations in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, especially, um, you know, I, I, I am not a medical doctor, so and I'm not going to be or, or going to claim to be one, but uh, there are these Bluetooth enabled devices, including the glucometers, uh, so we can uh, collect the data and push it into our platform through those third party integrations. So you can, so that uh, then uh, when, when the caretaker comes into our dashboard or we could also, once we put it into our dashboard, we can push that data into uh, EHRs, EMRs of the world. We have uh, done some integration work with point click care and with Yardi as well, so that we push that data onto those platforms. So a user, whether it's uh, 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 the physician, nurse, caretaker, they can go and look into the platform that they are used to. They don't have to learn yet another platform that we are providing. So, um, yeah, so we have done some work around third-party integration with uh, um, with these uh, Bluetooth-enabled devices. Interesting. So with, with that, and, you know, something that I just thought about when you were answering that is it's twofold. So part one is... Is there any sort of threat, you know, I'm, I'm thinking on an extreme level, right? Uh, from uh, security and, and data, you know, and that being uh, hacked, for example, like, you know, what is there like, I mean, do companies have safe, I'm, they have safety mechanisms in place right now, but like, I mean, the, this is a newer field, right? So uh, oh, what yeah, are y'all yeah, doing, yeah. at least from, you know, your company, Somatics, uh, you know, in order to keep that data private? Um, and also, how are you utilizing that? And are y'all utilizing that? Um, like, to a cost point, like, can you take this to insurance companies and be like, look, if your users wear this, like, you're going to be able to detect a lot more things faster, which will lead to, you know, hopefully making better uh, decisions uh, about the profile of your customer? Oh yeah, uh, great, great question. Absolutely, I mean, uh, uh, security, compliance, all of these are absolutely necessary, especially in a healthcare setting where, you know, you don't wanna give out uh, patient data and that's that's a big no-no, right? Um, so we have worked, uh, we are working with uh, uh, big pharma companies, big insurance companies, and we go through uh, a whole lot of security clearance audit before we even get into, uh, you know, like before even we get a seat at the table in order to have collaboration projects with them. So, uh, so what does that entail? So that entails making sure that your, you know, um, dashboards are are HIPAA compliant, that are GDPR compliance, uh, uh, you know, like PPI, PII, all of these things. You want to absolutely make sure 
that uh, the data that gets um, collected from the variables onto the band, uh, you know, all of the uh, uh, user information is anonymized uh, when, when we look at apply the AI ML algorithms on top of that. So, uh, uh, and also, you know, especially when data is being transferred, let's say, uh, uh, from the cloud onto our platform, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud or being transferred, as I said, with these third-party integrations from one platform to the other, you also want to make sure um, the data that is in motion and also the data that is at rest are all, uh, um, you know, secured, whether it's uh, secured and encrypted while it is put on the wire and transferred from uh, uh, one platform to the other, right? So that uh, uh, two fifty six bit encryption, you know, all all of the buzzwords around security um, compliance uh, um, need to be met, and for absolute good reasons. Because uh, uh, any any private information, especially health information, getting out is uh, is is really terrible. Yeah. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Me. We did have an, a few questions. I'm going to ask Akash to connect with you offline because, I mean, Absolutely. these look like pretty in-depth questions. Um, so, Akash, if you don't mind connecting with Dr. Me offline uh, in order to stay on track of time. Uh, Dr. Me, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you. Really excited to be here. Enjoyed the session. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.